Hey, hey, everybody. How's it going? We are delighted today. We have got one of our favorite people on the planet today with us, Matt Hangen. From and he's Water been Ford. all around the planet, actually. He, has. he is like a global voice in the water crisis. Matt is um, the leader of Water 4, which is based here in Oklahoma City, but they're a global nonprofit and truly some of the most innovative folks that we've been had the pleasure of getting to know. Um, but Matt has got an insane story, truly. Um, I remember sitting across from him at a coffee shop here in town whenever we used to be able to have coffee in town and on a normal <laughs> day of the week and um, just getting drawn into Matt's story and his heart um, for this mission and this purpose. Um, and so he is just a truly dynamic person. So I can't wait for you to meet him. So I, th I just want to kick it to Matt and just let him give some of the background of how you got pulled into the water crisis. I know you started off in Africa. You didn't start off in Africa, but your story starts in Africa. So I'd love to kick it to you, Matt. Yeah, sure. Honored to be here with you guys and excited to uh, be one of your premier podcast interviews. So I'll try to make it interesting for everybody. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Thank you, man. Yes. Appreciate it. So it all started at Pascagoula, Mississippi. Uh, no, I'm not going to start there. Um, <laughs> Close to your mother. <laughs> uh, no, um, I uh, I got hooked, you know, in in development work uh, overseas uh, for sure in Africa. Uh, my uh, like sophomore year of college, I went on my second sort of short term mission trip, and what I'd learned on the first one was that I really connected and. and uh, um, you know, felt at home working with people with my hands and then staying with people in their homes and uh, sort of avoiding the hotel, uh, you know, and, and, and Netflix mission trip and really getting into what people's lives were like and getting to know them well. While I was there, there was a, uh, a group that had come from Kenya or come from Uganda to Kenya, and they were telling me about the uh, LRA crisis in northern Uganda. At this time, I don't know if you if you remember it, Invisible Children, Joseph Coney. Yeah. There was a huge like a refugee crisis where Coney had essentially taken over the northern part of the country and had forced people into these internally displaced person or IDP camps. And uh, the Invisible Children was a sort of premier storytelling nonprofit that had launched uh, that that same year, and was telling the story of these these kids and families that were forced to. Uh, sort of set up and board within empty schools and buildings in, in, uh, in Gulu, Gulu, Uganda. So I was there, you know, I had, uh, you know, just fallen in love with uh, Africa and her people and, you know, uh, heard about that, went back to my school and started being one of their sort of top, uh, you know, fundraisers, I guess, accidentally. I showed the Invisible Children videos. We got our social uh, clubs together. It was a Christian school, so we'd have frats and we had social clubs. Um, and so we, we all got together and uh, did yard sales and spaghetti cookouts. And uh, we ended up getting Dave Barnes and Gab McGraw to like throw concerts on oh campus. We raised $8,000. Yeah, I mean, which, you know, it was this little grassroots movement. Everybody rallied together. We filled our auditorium and, um, and it, was, it was super exciting uh, to see how uh, storytelling about this crisis uh, brought our, our university together. I uh, contacted Invisible Children, had $8,000. It was like, here we go. And uh, one of the reps that took the call said, hey, you, you raised $8,000 in a semester. You need to go. Like, you, you need to go over there, man, and, like, see this. Um, so I said, sure. So we went to uh, a couple of the churches that had known me on campus uh, and around Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, where I was going to school and, and got support to go to Uganda, found a mission mission team there, uh, went and did an internship uh, for three months. And they said, you know, on the weekends, you can go up uh, to Northern Uganda, Lira, and to these IDP camps and, you know, distribute aid and uh, buy beans and blankets and do whatever. So I ended up uh, hitchhiking to Northern Uganda. Uh, of course riding you did. <laughs> On top of 18 wheelers in the starlight, you know, full of corn. Oh my Realize God. that uh, pro corn bags are actually full of lots of little weevils and bugs that make for uncomfortable mornings uh, when you sleep on them all night. <laughs> Bought beans and blankets and tons of food, and then uh, took these little trucks up into the IDP camps to distribute food. And realized that there was like Christian and Muslim like divisions, and I'd have to figure out how to organize people and you know equitably and distribute food and aid and and then tell the story of why I was there. Like, why was this 22 year old even there with all this stuff? And where did I come from? And, um, 
and just and fell in love with it. And people, uh, it's my first real exposure to a type of pain that I'd never envisioned before too. And, and people had literally had their, their limbs cleaved by machete wielding rebels. And uh, the government was mowing people down with helicopter gunships. The rebels were taking everything they owned and burning the camps with people in them. Um, and just all of this raw, terrible pain started to start out that way. Um, but to be in that place and see what a little bit of hope would do, what a little light, what a little love, what compassion and what someone from the outside could represent coming into the inside uh, to just listen to stories and connect people. So that was definitely, um, you know, my sort of finding myself. Formative. Uh, yeah, and uh, my uh, uh, now wife and I had been dating. Uh, she flew over and met me at the end of the trip in Kenya, and uh, we spent a month together, and I proposed at the end of it, and uh, she said yes, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> I bet we're moving to Africa, aren't we? And, uh, <laughs> and I said, please. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we got back and raised support and went to Togo, West Africa, as missionaries, we set a goal of like eight months. We're, we're like, whatever we raise in eight months is what we'll raise. We'll go to Africa and figure it out from there. And so we had found a mission team and this missionary had pulled out these like paper maps and like showing me these are unreached people groups here. And, you know, these are the bad roads and this is where you'll die of cholera. And, uh, you know, nobody wants to go here because it's so hard. And I was like, yes, yes. Sign Don't me ever up. tell you Matt Hangen what he cannot do. That's a little tip for everybody in life. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, uh, we like sold everything we owned and went to this little French language school, lived in a tiny, like, you know, cardboard box apartment in, uh, in the Savoie region of France and studied French and went to Togo. That's what they speak there. And, um, you know, we, we, we thought here we are, we, we had this quote from, uh, Steve Saint that said, you know, I don't want to live a long life, but a full one. And we thought, let's just do this. You know, let's, let's just go and see what happens. So uh, long story short, we did what we did everywhere, which is go live with people and try to get to know them and figure out you know, their stories. And one of those families um, couldn't have children. We worked with them to help adopt children. And then uh, the brother and sister, Olivia and Deanne, one of them uh, died of waterborne illness uh, months after we had helped the family uh, adopt them. And it devastated uh, everyone. Yeah, and we, we were devastated. Um, and we were there when he passed. And we were there at the hospital and saw the broken down healthcare system. We saw um, the family without resources, unable to do something in a moment of crisis for someone that they, they cared abundantly for. Um, and then we saw the family rationalize it at, at the end of his, his death, a nine-year-old boy, uh, that it was normal, that it, five other children had died at the water crisis had done this, but it was what it was and everyone would move on. And uh, I couldn't move on. I just, you know, it was, it was, it was too small a thing to take somebody who was so incredible his life away. And we'd, we'd seen him go from living in Swaller with seven other kids and his grandmother in this rural location, and all of a sudden being accepted and loved and doing homework on the side of their hut with chalk. And I, you know, I, playing inside our tent, you know, as we camped in their compound and uh, laughing and life. And then to see all that extinguished from, uh, you know, something that we, that we take for granted. I mean, something like clean water. And, um, our instinct was, you know, to, to drill a well, uh, you know, it was to build a well drilling kit out of local scrap material uh, to go to a junkyard in town work with a welder and build drilling equipment. We drilled a well with the 12, with 12 men from that village um, and designed a pump from local materials and started pumping water uh, and did seven other wells in their village. Um, I, I think grief management more than anything else. Um, but when we were done, it was like this weight had been completely lifted off the lives of 700 people they had been a part of the solution. They had drilled the wells. They had brought the water we needed to drill the wells. They had mixed the concrete and brought the sand and um, prepared the food for the work, you know, team. And uh, we saw 
just this vision that, um, you know, we had ideal, idealized that this sort of empowerment could happen, but had never known how to do it. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, we saw a church, you know, blow out of its building and size and, um, everything changed, real transformation happened. And, uh, we talk about excitement, wanting to be a part of something, uh, that was sort of it. I grew up, like I say, in rural Alabama, uh, born in Pascagoula, redneck, uh, welded, worked on our own tractors. Uh, you know, always had a table of scrap metal laying around. We never bought a bolt, to my knowledge. My father would never actually pay for anything, uh, mounting hardware. So we would dump the five-gallon buckets over on the floor of the garage and sort through everything and, you know, find the one so screw. <laughs> you were born to be the MacGyver of Africa oh, yeah. is what oh, you're yeah. saying. MacGyver I mean, Africa. really, a farm boy, I married a farm boy, so they can make anything work out of any rudimentary tools yeah. that are just sitting there. So that's a perfect match. Yeah, you would always carry the bars of chocolate with you to patch the hole in the sulfuric acid tanks in the underground nuclear bunker <laughs> in South Korea. That's why I got your back. But, yeah, it's that sort of like uh, Apollo 13, you know, do what you can with what you have where you are. Uh, that's a Ben Franklin quote, um, you know, type of mentality and, and make it happen. So it, you know, helped us deal with the grief. It helped the family deal with the grief. And then it stopped the deaths. Uh, you know, we filled in the hand dug wells that were making everyone sick. Um, and then it wasn't an assumption that the elderly would get sick and die prematurely. It wasn't an assumption that the children who, you know, or had some pre-existing issue like worms or malaria would drink the water and then pass away. It was like, oh, well, maybe now things can be kind of normal. We can kind of focus on attachment with our kids because we're not going to lose them. And we can focus on, you know, school because we're not going to wait until they are over nine or 10 and look like they're going to make it over the curve of death by waterborne illness. We're going to go ahead and invest in them beforehand. And everything started changing. And, um, we drilled like 12 wells and I looked on the internet for a better way to drill wells than what we had made because it was really painful. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, water floor, Oklahoma city based organization had launched the very windows 98 website uh, with some <laughs> fuzzy drilling equipment on it. And I, I can hear a, the sound as you just said, windows 98. I, I can hear the logging on logo sound. early on too. Yeah. 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 yeah I, <laughs> At that time, we were on real low internet, but it's like, you know, you're squinting at the pictures, you're like, that looks interesting. Uh, <laughs> and so I emailed every link on the webpage and got a response from the three individuals that were part of Water 4, the founder, one of the engineers, and executive director. Uh, four months later, I had a Water 4 a team with drilling equipment in Togo uh, with the pumps they designed and drilling tools. And we drilled a successful well in three days instead of 12. Um, and drilled 37 that year uh, and hit 100 wells the next year. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're really taking off. That's about when my body decided to completely implode, uh, which is probably for another podcast. But uh, I found myself in a hospital in Togo myself. Um, because I'm from Alabama and because I like a challenge, I decided that I could probably eat and drink what everyone else did because if anyone else could do it, I could do it. Uh, bad idea on a biological level. Um, and so I, you know, I had this notion a lot of people do it's like, well, they must get used to the dirty water. They must get used to the food because everyone's alive. Well, they're not, they're like sick. They're terribly sick. They just are more robust mentally than we are dealing with suffering. So they just are sort of forced to continue in this life. And, uh, I had Shigella, Salmonella, E. coli, cerebral malaria, and every other organ trail malady that you can possibly imagine. And, <laughs> Uh, I don't want to laugh. I, I don't. Oh, it's yeah, I was Only Matt can laugh about that. There's a Nacho Libre quote that I would throw out here, but you know, it's, uh, do it. We'll put it in the show notes. Absolutely. <laughs> Talk about it later. Uh, but you know, like it was, it was a, uh, it was a rough time, and uh, I had these latent autoimmune conditions that essentially I fried my uh, immune system. My body came out attached, it attacked itself, and then I was in a hospital hearing a doctor talk about last wishes and um, you know wills and powers of attorney to my wife while I was sedated on morphine, Demerol, uh, you know, being kept alive, um, they try to figure out how to, how to evacuate me and you know, what next steps would be. Um, and came back and was confined to a wheelchair for six months, told I'd be disabled the rest of my life. Um, because I had a wrecked body from the same thing that was wrecking everyone else's body, um, and lives in Africa. 
by God's grace, um, you know, I've had a nine year path of healing, but, uh, uh, you know, I had doctors and people come around me and then water force founders who offered me a job in that state. So that I'd have health insurance and could actually do something about where I found myself. Um, I stand here, I stand here today. We, uh, it took, uh, about nine months for me to, to be back up and walking. I was on 30 drugs. We went back to Africa, of course. This uh, is the part Africa. of the story. I remember the first time I heard this, I was like, Matt. Record the scratch. The only person I know that would go back to Africa after this. Yeah. It's like, I just like suitcase full of medicine. You know, I was like, I'm totally fine. I've got this. Uh, you know, I'm tapering off all the medicines. It'll be all right. Um, and went back to Africa. I had to come in and out to get all these. I was on cancer drugs, all this sort of heavy medicine. And, we went back and to my surprise, uh, ministry was flourishing without me. Uh, they had drilled 30 something wells, they planted eight churches. And it was like, I was writing them letters and stuff in the hospital and uh, you know, for a month while I was there and I came back and people were opening up these letters I had written and distributed like they were letters to the church at, at Ephesus, you know, and like had written and I had written oh. words um, in a, in a Sorry, in a moment of like thinking they might be my last words to those churches uh, and to those individuals. And so I had written them uh, you know, with a lot of conviction and emotion. And um, I came back and they had read and reread and shared um, these calls to action and had taken them seriously. And, and uh, God had done amazing things uh, in these communities and in these people's lives. So. Um, I came back and they sort of pulled out the keys and were like, here, you know, we're so glad you're back. You're going to be fine. Here's the ministry keys. We're so glad you're back here to lead. And it was this rare moment of 27 year old wisdom. I said, I cannot, cannot drive the bus anymore. Like you guys have done this. This is what it's about. I, I can't stay here. Like I, I now have to, I'll coach you and shadow you, but I'll be here for a year and a half, but I have to leave. And so, um, that was such a pivotal turning point. At that point, I worked for Water 4, and I think that lesson and having a leadership that was ready for that lesson, I was able to share with them, like, we cannot continue to do short-term trips of Americans to drill wells for people in Africa. We have got to figure out a way to start this with this end in mind, and this end being that people know how to do it on their own. They're mobilized. They're empowered. They're creative. They're, you know, acquiring new markets. They're working in communities, and they can do this without Western, you know, financial support and uh, you know technical support and so that's that's sort of how it all that all, it all started we moved back to the u.s at this point it was 2013 took our two-door honda civic with its 5-8 trailer behind it our dog <laughs> drove to oklahoma it. and uh camped up in a cabin in yukon found a house in guthrie and uh, at that time water forward done about uh, i think in 20 2011, when I joined, it was a little over a thousand wells, and we just crossed six thousand uh, water projects. Um, 1.6 million people, um, and we took, you know, the vision of local people being the, you know, fixing their local problems with local solutions, uh, you know, to its largest scale over the last decade. So it's mm. really hard to follow up right? and even ask a question after that. Play the uh, outro music. Let's yeah, go ahead and wrap great. this one. that's Thanks for joining <laughs> us. Um, but I think you said something there that is is so beautifully ironic to me, knowing your story, because you, as you come back and they're trying to hand you this key, you're saying, no, no, this is yours now. You pick yeah. up this torch. You carry this torch. You be the light. And to me, it's so wonderfully ironic that that is what Water 4 is all about. It's not about coming in and just dropping these wells, you know, sending engineers over if they break. I mean, the day that I heard, because I think everybody on this podcast listening knows of a water crisis charity somewhere in either yeah. United States, in this continent, somewhere around the world. But the day I found out that there's a billion dollars worth of broken infrastructure in Africa right now from wells because the locals it's not it, it wasn't one of those situations where it was like teach a man to fish it was like they just gave the man the fish and that yep. is what I want you to talk about because I think it's so unique you don't want to come in and be the solution you're giving the solution to these people and asking them to carry it 
Yeah, no, totally. And it's, it's one of these lessons that we learned, you know, early in ministry. It was, we had, uh, you know, as a mission team, our team decided like the reason people aren't planning churches is because the villages are so far apart. So if we just buy everyone bicycles, they'll be able to go to these far apart villages and then they'll be able to plant more churches and things will solve themselves. So we put our you know pennies together, bought these like 30 or 40 bicycles and handed them out. And uh, guess what happened with all the bicycles? They were made for parts to build a well. Well, no, they went to the market. They, uh, you know, got borrowed by everyone. They got broke down. They did a lot of things other than go to villages to help plant churches. Uh, and the, the instinct we have, especially as Americans, is like this technology is what people need to fix it. And you, know, you might see someone that's living on the streets now and you think, well, we just bought them a car. Then they could go to work and then things will fix themselves. Maybe a transportation issue. But technology is a part of a solution. It's not a solution. And, uh, what we realized at Water 4 is we had to build leaders and businesses and, and develop and understand local markets and, and then go into communities and understand what, what are their drivers and what are, what, how do they make their decisions and uh, work with them to understand that, uh, that dirty water isn't free, that it has this cost monetarily and physically and socially. Uh, we, uh, yeah, I think a lot of charities unintentionally get in a place where they are set up to, uh, you know, sort of consume resources for outputs. And so it's easy to measure things like wells and hand pumps. It's really hard to measure things like how long does that hand pump continue to function after it's installed? Uh, what amount of local revenue has been generated for the maintenance and life cycle cost of that pump? Uh, and, and I may be ahead of you, Becky, but you know, one of the things is, is I don't think people understand that like a pump is like anything else. It's this machine that has to be constantly maintained and maintenance and it's going to wear down and break and average hand pump runs for 11 months before it breaks. And then you have to fix a bearing on it or fix a, you know, one of the pump rods or fix the seal in it. But if people aren't equipped to do that or don't have an understanding that's a, that it's their responsibility. You have a five to, to $20,000 well with a hand pump in it now that's just sitting there unused and broken um, because the end wasn't in mind. The end that people envisioned was the installation of this water pump or water system, not that people would have it forever. And I think that's what's really unique about Water 4 is we thought, what does an eradicated water crisis look like? Dick Green, our founder from the beginning, you know, now I see Charity Water saying it. Uh, thanks for, thanks for that, guys. Uh, <laughs> Original but, uh, content, copyright Dick Greenlee, 2008. Well, Harrison, I got a bone to pick. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, you know, Dick Greenlee said, you know, back in 2008, we're going to eradicate the world water crisis. And here we were, this $100,000 nonprofit in Oklahoma City. Um, but it's like thinking like that, like what does it look like for it to be over? What do people's days look like and what's it going to take to be over is what forces you to think through the sort of systems that I think Water Force thought through. Um, we're really passionate about that. And so we've, we've taken like the highest level of our, you know, ownership of creating sustainable businesses full of passionate leaders who believe the work that they do is building their nation and building communities and, um, and want to see it go on forever. So, Matt, there's just so many ways to follow up on this, but I love how, you know, your story, you have experienced actually the pain of the problem. Um, yeah. You've seen it, you felt it, all of it, all of the effects, and even had seen people go through it in, in, in front of it too. So I just think, you know, how do you, because I know we've had chats before of you just don't want to pile a bunch of Americans on a plane to go experience this. It's just not a good use of resources to do that. How do you translate this or when have you seen the light bulb go off of how do you translate that kind of a mission to a donor base here? Maybe they are American, maybe they're Canadian. How do you share that story with people and what resonates? Yeah, I, you know, I think the more people understand it in terms of the person, because it's a 2 billion person problem annually. Wow. I it's mean, hard to even like two billion people. That. It's just yeah. you know, the same amount of people that die a day from COVID-19 at its peak is the same amount of people that die every day from diarrheal disease alone. Yet it's this sort of unspoken, you know, un, un, it doesn't change anything for the world. Uh, we just keep on going. And so if you think about how dominating COVID-19 is right now, uh, rightfully, um, you know, the, the water crisis is of the same scale and proportions across, you know, the same global scale. And, All the time. That is profound. I mean, right? I mean, 
it's not even at a peak. It's just all the time. It's at that level. All the time. That's yeah. it's sort of humming at that rate and then, and, and, uh, and continuing to grow. And so, uh, you know, that number is just staggering, but it's, it's when you can actually tell a story, you know, we have, we started our first well at water four was in a village, um, on an Island actually in Zambia, in Mabala Island. And a woman named Petronella lived there with her family and Petronella had to walk into a lake, uh, that had crocodiles in it. Um, that had cholera in it because fishermen would come swell around the island and fish seasonally. There's not enough sanitation latrines. So people defecate in the lake where people drink, where there's crocodiles, diseases spread. And Petronella, you know, was there, uh, including her and her, her three-year-old son, um, you know, living on this island, fetching water um, that threatens to take their lives just by fetching it and also by consuming it. Um, and then Water 4 drilled the first well ever in history on Imbabala Island, uh, put a hand pump in. So they finally had clean water coming from an aquifer instead of the lake um, about nine years ago. And then today, there's piped water across the entire island at every home, school, and clinic on Imbabala Island for over 10,000 people. And Petronella is a community health worker who goes out and teaches people about health, sanitation, and, and hygiene measures. Um, and you know, her, her family's grown and she, and she walks out and opens a tap and water that's clean and chlorinated flows into, you know, her cup that she drinks out of and, and uh, uh, still there at home. And I think th those are, I think when, when those donors who, who are giving to all these organizations because of their compassion, their desire to help people, their de desire to see, um, you know, equity spread across the world and, and God's love spread across the world and, and act out of compassion. I think when they see um, that their gift and generosity uplifts people in a way where they take that and continue to build off of it and where there's um, water development, where Petronella pays three cents a day for that piped water and it covers all the operations, maintenance, life cycle costs, but it's affordable. It's something she's proud of. It's aspirational. Um, Did you say three cents a day? Three cents a day, yeah. Wow. I could find that in my couch cushions. I mean, really <laughs> think about it. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's one of the other things about Water 4 is we've, we've really gotten the cost down for even the infrastructure mm -hmm. to be super low because we know to scale the 2 billion people, the cost has to be low cost yet highly reliable and robust. And so we've put ourselves in that box to deliver really great safe products to people who are earning two dollars a day um that'll change their lives forever so it, it's really i think it's really those are the, that's the story and those are the stories that that are inspiring um you know for people and um, you know when i go back to villages in togo and all of the kids are still there i've got some pictures where I, you know i took a picture of the family and the, the nine children and then i go back to, and i've actually got one right here above me uh that's probably bad for a podcast. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Log on to YouTube, check, out check YouTube. it out. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, uh, you know, go back and take the second picture, and all the kids are still there, and they're smiling, and they're healthy, oh and their bellies are flat, normal, you know, and uh, they don't have the distended stomachs anymore. And those are the moments I think where donors can really see, you know, that not only did they have that instinct to get in and join us and, and envision a different world, reimagine a different reality, but then when we can actually show them how that, how that has blossomed into this even more beautiful picture than we had envisioned when we started. Because nine years ago, we never dreamed that Imbabal Island would have pipe water and you know, all, all of these things. We'd have hand washing stations at schools, keeping kids from spreading coronavirus and other diseases right now because, um, because of what water started nine years ago. Continuous improvement. And wanted to, we want people to have what we have. And, uh, That's it. Most people. I mean, it's, it is truly generational affecting. And I, and I tie it back to something that you said early on, which I, has been staying with me for the last 15, 20 minutes. And you said that parents cannot form attachments with their yeah. children when they have dirty water. And I think about, is there anything more powerful on this earth than the love you have for your children? And to feel like you would have to keep that at a distance it because of your us. life. It is shocking. Like we like observed that people and it was perplexing this like harshness. It was like, where's this harshness coming from? And then like we, as we form relationships and bond with people and talk, it's, you know, it's like, well, we, 
we can't culturally, we can't emotionally attach to children until they've reached an age in which we know they're going to survive. And, yeah. and to think about those first, you know, I have a three-year-old and, and an 18 month old. And to think about these last, you know, three years of moments and joy and, you know, the gift that that's been to my life, um, to think about not being able to fearing, being able to do that because, you know, this, this, this very water 60 feet beneath their feet, you know, like it's a, it's a $2,000 solution for a whole community. It's like, you know, what it's, a picture though, that it's like they're living above the solution, you know, that it's yeah. that distance of 60 feet, you know, for unlocking so much change. I mean, that's a powerful visual. And for an uh, evolved civilization, you know, like yeah. America is so progressive, we couldn't even imagine thinking in that terms, yeah. you know. So here, here comes Matt. Look at uh, his face. Okay, <laughs> you, you see it. So we are literally <laughs> witnessing history right now. I'm going to go rogue on you guys. Love uh, it. Julie, cut this out. I'm Sean's <laughs> nervous. I'm excited. Go, go. If, uh, if you're not a geek, you may not know this, but, you know, we are in the process of staging humans on the moon in the Artemis Project where we're bringing up what the recent – Dragon launch to the International Space Station is begin to stage materials up so that we can inhabit the moon first. So we're doing this stage. We're going to build a base. Um, you know, we're going to put people on the moon. We're going to experiment, see what life is like there. Um, because we're sending people to Mars uh, to live there in the same sort of environment. And so we're getting stuff staged on the moon, getting people used to it, and then staging from there to take off to go to Mars. The fact that we can even envision that in a world where people are drinking brown, dirty surface water that's taking 5,000 people's lives a day is, is you know, mind-boggling to me. It's, it's this, you know, I love everything about what's happening right now with Artemis and the Mars um, uh, program and have since I was a little kid cutting newspaper articles out in my three-inch binder. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's like we need to look at the world in the same way. Let's stage international development. Let's take an area. Let's you know completely eradicate the water crisis in that place. That's our moon landing. Let's show that we can do a moon landing everywhere we work. Let's you know eradicate the water crisis, and then let's go to Mars. Let's eradicate the water crisis in that entire nation, and let's move you know from border to border across the places where we work, and and show what. Uh, you know, a transformed earth looks like where people can thrive and flourish and live without this sort of despair. Sure, I hope we're on Mars at the same time, but guys, we got to do this. I got, you know, we have to beat Elon Musk uh, by 2030. <laughs> if that guy's on Mars and the water crisis is still here, we should be, you know, a little defeated. I don't like to be defeated. So we know. We can, we feel your competitiveness. <laughs> and I have to say that this yeah. is my most favorite thing about Matt and getting to know Matt. Matt is one of the first people in nonprofit that I remember, you know, hearing him say, why am I at a nonprofit? I am not here to earn my paycheck day by day, year by year, generation by generation. I want to be put out of business. And Matt has this audacious goal I want you to talk about, like the Water for 2030 vision, because it's something that for everybody listening, I mean, it really kind of digs into the w what can you do in the space that you're at right now to eradicate the issues that are plaguing your nonprofit. So please talk a little bit about the 2030 yeah. vision. I mean, the first thing we realized, we couldn't boil the ocean. You know, we couldn't do this at any sort of scale as a small, you know, nonprofit operating in Oklahoma City. So the first thing was three years ago, we, we set our compass on this idea of district coverage in every country where we work. So we were kind of going around drilling wells, you know, here and there as we got calls or met relationships. And the reality was, is we were just sort of, you know, putting out fires, uh, but not dealing with the drought. And, um, and so we said, okay, we need to, in every country, identify a region where we have a concentration of relationships and wells. We need to map those. We need to map the demographics, the people's, their financial capacity, the other water sources. And then we need to make this, uh, you know, district wide plan where we go, you know, from north to south, east to west uh, and eradicate the water crisis in those places. And so we um, started with low hanging fruit and we're working our way up by 2030. We're going to have 20 districts covered in 15 countries. We're raising one hundred forty six million dollars to do that. Um, and we're doing it in enough places where we can demonstrate that uh, diverse economic scenarios, governmental scenarios, um, and water resource scenarios uh, can all 
you know, have the problem solved uh, despite each of their distinct challenges. And, and we're doing this in places that are rural. You know, it's not, we're not going out to big cities where people, where it's easy. We're doing this in really small towns and rural communities and bringing them, uh, you know, services that um, I think we have, con we have thought will take a hundred years. We're going to bring it now and we want to disrupt the way that what our charity is being done uh, and, and, and come in and say for $25 a person, you can have piped water across a whole region uh, and a sustainable business in place with a public private partnership uh, established with the government and um, you know, have it set up to run on its own in perpetuity. That's, that's not the way people are thinking about it. Currently it's let's do a $65 a person survey, uh, you know, and, <laughs> and then we'll start building and then it'll cost $125. And it's this, mentality of we're always going to be here we, we need to be economic engines that consume aid resources um and it's a culture that we've allowed to build up and um you know what are for you know we just don't have that culture and uh we're pretty passionate about working ourselves out of a job i uh, love that i just encourage everyone listening to channel the hanging challenge <laughs> and figure out because it, it's so compelling and i got to give matt props because he just hit two of our core beliefs for our company which is <laughs> around disruption and about starting with the base the least people yeah. and getting you know small rural getting that base of people to sort of galvanize and become passionate supporters because how compelling is that from uh, if you're a donor to say, I don't want your gift just to build some wells. I want your gift to eradicate this. I want you to come alongside me and we can create generations of families that know what it's like to love their children fully, to live a full life. It's just such a noble cause. I commend you for it. Yeah, one of our pillars is to reimagine. It's like, what if you could reimagine that people could have access to safe water in a way that would actually pay for their neighbors to have safe water in the future too? What if three cents a day could be leveraged to do more water systems for homes, schools, and clinics in the future? You know, our, our ambitious goal is to actually create profitable ecosystems of, of uh, water networks that'll fund other water networks going forward. It's this idea of the parable of talents in the Bible that talks about, you know, taking what you have and multiplying it by seven and 10. Uh, what if we could have an ROI when in seven years, we've actually gained the capital costs that were in a system and are now paying for other systems over seven years. And uh, that's, that's what really gets us exciting. And we can do food, we can do energy, we can do, you know, there's plenty to do in the world. Uh, and I think as nonprofits, we should, and, and, and people, we should be trying to work ourselves out of a job so that we can move on to the next exciting, creative thing. That's awesome. And I think, you know, Becky and I have had the chance to get to kind of get an insider peek as we work with you and the team this year. Um, and I think y'all do so many things that are entrepreneurial and disruptive and just the culture that you've created of that is really awesome. I wanted to point out one of my favorite things. I know <laughs> where you're is, going. I'm okay. so excited. <laughs> um, is, is the way that you steward some of your donors. So all of the team, this is hilarious. Anytime you'll be on a Zoom chat with them, they've got like WhatsApp, which if you don't know what WhatsApp is, join the club. I don't know what WhatsApp is still. I think it's an app. But Go to the app store. They're just constantly connected as a team here in the U.S., but also as a team globally. And so I want to kick it to Matt to explain how they use it, but I'll put yeah. this link in the show notes, but this is a hack for you guys for stewardship. Yeah, back in the day, you know, I was the only program person in Water 4, and I was traveling to 30 countries training people, and I quickly realized that I needed to start leaving behind the education network, and so I would be me in the Uganda group, and I have like 30 people, and I would, you know, help them fix tools and, you know, weld up a new tool to get through the problem they had or talk how to, you know, solve whatever problem it was, and, and then I started doing multinational trainings, and I'd have people from all these countries come together. And then we'd create a group where it was like, okay, all of us had the shared learning experience should be on this one group chat on WhatsApp. And then we'll all talk to each other. And what's happening in Uganda, we can share with DRC. And that's evolved us having these groups across 10 different core competencies in our field. And we get all this feedback and chatter from the people we work with every day. Well, when I became CEO, you know, I was like, well, this has been really helpful for me in managing and stewarding relationships and, and uh, passing on knowledge. So why don't we just make everyone uh, do that? So instead of Slack or, you know, some other uh, texting platform, we use WhatsApp 
And what's really neat about it is that all the field information our development officers get to see. So stuff happening with health and hygiene, with discipleship, with water resources, working communities. And so that's all funneling into the same communication platform that we're using across the organization to talk about uh, proposals and um, you know fundraising opportunities and donor stewardship relationships or uh, you know just sort of uh, community share prayer requests across our staff and teams and uh, to talk about um, you know wish people a happy birthday and we'll use it you know in, in all across the organization as a way to encourage to share uh, I'll send out a PSA to to 480 people uh, through that one platform and be able to you know share a vision uh, share encouragement and, and we've, we've done that a lot throughout COVID-19 where we have this sort of integrated communication network um, and I can pull right now a photo and print it out on a small printer that's next to my desk and put it in a thank you card and send to a donor and say this literally came in 20 minutes ago this is what's happening in Sierra Leone uh, and send that out to someone so um, you know, people like instant communication. They like social media. They want to be able to get stuff. And they, you need to make it easy for your team to communicate, communicate quickly and effectively. And WhatsApp's been really good for us uh, for that sort of informal um, chatter and, and updates. I just think it's so cool so to cool. think that whether you're a million dollar donor or a $10 a month donor, if you got a message, a, a text message from your gift officer that says, Hey, Ms. Endicott, thanks for your gift. I just wanted to show you this picture of this mom and her baby strapped to her back here in Zambia or Ghana. And this was this morning. And because of yeah. your gift and the charity of so many other people, we kept her from walking eight hours with this baby on her back, hauling, you know, this dirty water back to her community. I, how could you say no to giving again? <laughs> you know, it, it, it is right? the easiest <laughs> retention communication piece I could actually think of. So that's, that's bravo. bravo yeah, and our staff team. know the names of the people we work with and know the names of people in communities because of that too. And it's, it's just really powerful. Um, I encourage everyone to do that. Matt, every time Becky and I talk to you or any of us talk to you, we're always like, give us some wisdom and you've given us so much wisdom on this call as always. But um, part of ending every podcast, we always ask our guests to share one good thing and the heart of that is that something that's applicable, whether you're a water charity or whether you're sitting at home look, wanting to be in a charity, what's something you can do today in your life that can kind of push you forward toward creating more good wherever you're at? Put me on the spot. Yeah, I know. Um, I mean, for one, like, think big. You know, this, life's too short. You know, I was 27 and looked at, you know, dying in a hospital at, when I thought I was invincible. And, I try to live each day thinking like, what can I do with the time that I have and the time that I have left? And I, I don't know, nobody, nobody knows what we have. So I'd say dream big, eradicate whatever it is you're after. Uh, don't just put a dent in it or scratch in it. Try to try to do really big. And remember the only way that that's going to happen is, is by investing in people where that vision um, is owned by and, and carried on by uh, the people that, uh, who own the problem. And so uh, I think, you know, dream really stinking big and, uh, and make sure that that dream is, is uh, spread wildly uh, through everyone that you're working with in, in the process. I, I don't know what else I could add to that. <laughs> I mean, that That's is, perfect. that is a perfect, powerful statement. And I mean, who would have thought that um, the invisible children story started with Matt Hang, and this is for all the nonprofits out there that says, nobody ever reads my direct mail piece, right? Because wasn't <laughs> the invisible children, didn't that come to you as a direct mail piece to your college dorm or something in that vein? Yeah, I think, yeah. I, I think they had sent that out. We had heard about the problem and then got back and then there it was. And they had these DVD kits where you could throw a house party. And that was what did it for me. You know, like sent the DVD with a video on it and it had the little talking sheet. And I had cooked more frozen pizzas and baked more cookies that semester in my dorm apartment, <laughs> just showing that. Hey, um, you, you only hosting, lure, you only lure on. a college student with food. We Matt know this. I was hosting house parties. <laughs> Before college. they were a thing. <laughs> like who does this? <laughs> but That's really awesome. think about that one guy that sent that out from That's Invisible awesome. Children getting in the hand and looking at the ripple effect of what Matt just Matt as a singular human being could be ripple effect. That was my only water pun for the entire day. So 
Uh, Matt, we're just so grateful that you would come on and share this. I mean, I, I am just so inspired by you and the Water 4 nonprofit. The team is so incredible. Um, where can people go to connect with Water 4, learn more about your mission? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's easy. It's water in the number four dot org. Uh, and then we're on both Facebook, um, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and LinkedIn under water four as well. Uh, water four INC. Uh, we've got a cool water drop logo, which I should have on me, but I don't, uh, <laughs> we'll post it. No we'll problem. Show notes. We got it. <laughs> yeah. But also find the videos. I mean, y'all's videos. Oh my like, gosh. Yeah, if you can't too. go to Africa, I tell you, we watched one just like a couple weeks ago that Matt played as like one of the first w wells drilled in this community. And it's like the most underproduced video of all time. Totally. Right. <laughs> I mean, and I, we were ill prepared for it. I think mm -hmm. we were just like, okay, here comes a video. Actually, I couldn't even get the zoom to work. It's like, it stalled out. It was kind of lost this moment and then it played and it's literally just the sounds of children screaming with excitement and jumping yeah. and the jovial just sounds of water pouring out of this well. And it's just like <laughs> tears came to all of our oh, eyes. Absolutely. I mean, it's just what this is is so meaningful even though it seems so simple and innocuous sitting on our desk but it's like so powerful what you're doing and your team yeah so youtube you. at water four you know we've got a great youtube yeah. channel and it's amazingly produced stories and you know, i'd love for you guys to watch those and you know let us know and we'd love for you to be involved like it's a huge problem we can't do it alone so uh we've got an event coming up our walk for water that's gonna it has two options one is at scissor tail park on september 19th we can come out and actually carry a bucket of water around that lap and experience the water crisis. And so you'll see stories uh, through posters as you make each lap. We'll talk about the global crisis down to the personal crisis to the, to the great story of transformation afterward. But you and your kids and family can actually carry that bucket and see, you know, see what that three mile walk is like for people, um, you know, and, and tell that story and realize, you know, one, how big the problem is, but two, how, how great we actually have it uh, here. And we're doing a virtual component this year with Walk Where You Are, where you can actually do that with your family in your neighborhood, um, you know, with your church group or, or, or small group as another option. So that's on uh, Waterford's website. But our Walk for Water uh, is another great way where people can get an introduction to who we are and how to help. It takes a village. Yep. Thank you, Matt. We so appreciate your time. We yeah, appreciate, appreciate you, you guys. Good to see you.